On the line with us is Peter Montgomery. He's a senior fellow with People for the American Way, the managing director of Right Wing Watch, rightwingwatch.org. Uh, his uh, Twitter handle is Pete, M-O-N-T, P-E-T-E-M-O-N-T, -E -E or at Right Wing Watch. And uh, there's been a lot to talk about. Peter, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. In fact, my, it's an honor for me uh, to have you here. Uh, Peter, there, the Hill has been having these hearings on uh, extremist group threats. I mean, obviously, the January 6th hearings and whatnot, the, uh, they're supposed to come up with a final report next Wednesday, I believe, and the, and the next, uh, the, or the, maybe the last public hearing will probably be on Monday. Uh, what do we know about this? Well, we know a lot. Uh, thanks to the hearings, we know a lot more details about the uh, insurrection, not only the day of, but all the planning and scheming and criminal conspiracy that went into it. And uh, so the, the January 6th committee has done an amazing amount of truth telling. Uh, and then these other hearings that uh, Congressman Raskin has been overseeing uh, on the threat of, of violent white nationalism have also really... Uh, you know, used the oversight power of Congress to call attention to an extremely important problem uh, facing the country. And, and they've and gotten and they've gotten very are. little attention. And I know that you've been all over this, uh, the the confronting white supremacy uh, part seven, the evolution of anti-democratic extremist groups and the ongoing threat to democracy. This is this this hearing by Jamie Raskin. Um, what what were they learning? What did what what is worth sharing with people here? I think there's a few major takeaways, which is that um, in spite of all the uh, rhetoric we hear from the right about somehow that the, the country's threatened by woke ideology or uh, some kind of other false distractions they throw up, um, uh, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, the government is very clear that they see the biggest threat of domestic terrorism in this country is violent white supremacy. And that is an ideology that is, um, you know, fomented in, uh, online and that radicalizes people online, that it leads to, in real life, violence. It's also an ideology that spreads because it has high level validators, whether it's Tucker Carlson on Fox News or former President Donald Trump uh, having dinner with, uh, you know, white nationalist extremists at Mar-a-Lago, and that the uh, the January 6th insurrection did not end on January 6th, that uh, the extremist is, extremism is out there. In some ways, they've adopted new strategies to focus uh, more on state and local level battles. And we see uh, that kind of extremism and violence popping up, whether it's threats and harassment against uh, school boards and educators, whether it's a violent confrontations outside um, drag shows, uh, the, this ideology is is spreading and it's dangerous. Yeah, it, it, it definitely. What 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 sort? How how real is the the threat to America? Of well, in fact, it, it, can you define for us exactly what white supremacy, white nationalism, uh, what, what these what these things mean, and how they're being played out in the American political scene today? You know, I think they're connected in a lot of ways. There's a there's this line that runs through a lot of the far right ideologies we see: uh, white nationalism, Christian nationalism, white supremacy. It's the it's an underlying ideology that the United States was founded by and for white Christian people, and the white Christian people are therefore the quote unquote real Americans, and everyone else is not. And uh, if that's your worldview, then you can look at the increasing uh, diversity in this country and the growth of religious and ethnic diversity and pluralism, not as uh, something to be welcomed and as a strength of a democratic society, you can view it through the lens of white grievance. Like this was our country and these other people are taking it away from us. And that, kind of core uh, ideology and grievance underlies uh, a lot of the anti-Semitism that's out there. It underlies the anti-Black racism. And those are mixed together. In Buffalo, the shooter targeted Black people based on uh, his interpretation of this Great Replacement Theory, which was that 
you know, secretive Jewish forces were using black people to replace white people. And that kind of that great replacement theory, uh, we have seen that result in not only the killing of black people in Buffalo, but uh, Jewish people at the synagogue in Pittsburgh, Latinos at the Walmart in El Paso, um, Muslims in Christchurch, New Zealand. It's, it is a very deadly threat. And yet the great replacement theory uh, gets promoted, um, you know, ad nauseum on Fox News. Yeah, and 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 uh, and also on social media, uh, quite aggressively. Absolutely. But the United States is not unique in this. I mean, Sweden just elected a, a hard right uh, prime minister. Italy just elected a relatively openly fascist prime minister. And in both cases, the 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 main pressure that that provoked this was the the influx of of, of mostly Syrian refugees after uh, you know Putin bombed the crap out of. Aleppo and and uh, other parts of Syria, uh, you know, after uh, the, the the Arab Spring. I mean, there's a whole long backstory to it, but um, in both cases, those were you know white Swede and Italian Swedish and Italian uh, politicians who were saying, you know, our country is for white people. We are white people, and the, we've got all these brown people now in our country, and we've got to do something about it or kick them out or deny them citizenship or, you know, all these different things. This is not just happening in the United States. How, how although arguably we're the only country that has never uh, arguably officially defined itself as a, a country based on DNA. Um, and you could argue, I suppose, that Sweden and Italy, you know, ha have done that over the, over the years. But how, how, does, how does a country that wants to be pluralistic, that wants to that, that wants to embrace people, uh, you know, based on the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. How do how do we do that? How do we deal with this kind of a problem? How how do we deal with this kind of backlash essentially? I think we do it by asserting, um, by rejecting this idea that this is a country that is meant to be by and for a certain group of us and by affirming and actively promoting the idea that the American ideal is that we the people means all the people. And it's true that immigration and migration uh, can cause tensions. They have here, they have in a lot of parts of the world. But, uh, and I would uh, just to push back a little bit on the notion that the US has not defined people by DNA. The constitution certainly did that in its treatment of oh, uh, enslaved right. people. You're right. But, you know, we Thank have, you. We have fought, a lot of Americans have fought over the last couple hundred years to, to bring us closer to the ideal, which is, you know, being an American and being a citizen does not depend on where your parents were born, what color you are, uh, how you worship, whether you worship. Um, those are all, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of underlying American principles of, of pluralism, that at least the way America we have fought to, to bring it closer to its ideals. And so I think one of the things that needs to happen is for anybody who has a voice, whether it's an individual in their family and friends group, or whether it's a public official or someone who has a media platform, has to push back every time this um, uh, narrative that America was created for just some of us uh, and that other people don't belong here, shouldn't be here, uh, aren't real Americans, um, and 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 promote the the policies that go with that. Yeah, we and fought the Civil War to end that. The hatred that goes with that. That's yeah. Well, and you know, some of the there are people out there who are speaking openly about their desire for a new civil war, and there are groups that are, um, you know, trying to provoke racial violence with the belief that that is their route to creating a new civil war that'll uh, somehow. Uh, give them the path they want to a white ethno state or to a more authoritarian country that um, uh, is willing to impose uh, impose their worldview. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's an extraordinary moment in the, in the history of this country and, and frankly around the world. Um, we're speaking with Peter, uh, Peter Montgomery, who is a senior fellow of People for the American Way and the managing director of Right Wing Watch, rightwingwatch.org. Uh, and right wing watch on Twitter, Peter M O N T on Twitter as well. Peter, how, what are what are the dimensions of this problem in the United States? 
Well, you know, I think it's hard to um, get a grip really on on uh, uh, the extent of of um, people who might be moved to violence um, by being radicalized online. It's certainly enough of a problem that we've seen a lot of people killed as a result of it. Uh, we do know that, um, you know, there is a uh, some pretty good chunk of Americans out there, whether it's 15 or 20 or 25 percent, who um, bought into uh, QAnon conspiracy theories, who bought into Trump's uh, relentless lies about the 2020 election. Uh, we know that um, some sociologists who've, who've studied Christian nationalism have documented uh, in a very uh, strong way that the stronger a person's Christian nationalist beliefs are, the more likely they are to believe that political violence might be necessary to achieve, uh, to protect America as they see it, and and the more willing they are to support authoritarianism as a means to creating the kind of country they want. So I would say it's a very significant problem. Uh, it's also a very significant problem because uh, Donald Trump, the former president of the United States and uh, current candidate to become president again, continues to um, promote anti-democratic conspiracy theories to try to undermine confidence in elections. He even recently suggested that uh, the Constitution be set aside so that he could somehow be reinstalled as president, even though he lost. Right. And, uh, you know, I don't think Trump represents the majority of the people. He is not president anymore, partly because he does not represent the majority of the people. But we know he certainly has a lot of followers. He still has a lot of sway within the Republican Party. And, um, you know, I think it's a really bad sign that uh, a lot of high-level Republican officials were slow and reluctant to uh, criticize him when he recently had dinner with um, uh, Kanye West, who has uh, descended into promoting anti-Semitism, and uh, Nick Fuentes, who is, you know, really an extreme uh, racist, white nationalist, anti-Semitic promoter of online uh, material. And it's, it's you know, there's no excuse for uh, someone of Trump's um, position to give that kind of a person credibility and to uh, well, help them. There may not be an excuse, but I think that there's a reason, and that is that Trump believes that among the Republican primary voters, there are enough just naked racists and anti-Semites that, that he, can, he can ride that into the Republican nomination for president. Well, and he clearly, yeah, he clearly, I, I think you're right. I think that's his view of the base. He has also kind of hitched his wagon to people who are still adhering to uh, QAnon conspiracy theories. You know, um, and I will say, it just it isn't just Trump. Uh, this past election cycle, the Republican nominee for governor of Pennsylvania, major state, swing state, the Republican uh, nominee for governor was a guy who promotes Christian nationalism, who campaigned uh, with QAnon, conspiracy theorists, and, and other far-right folks. And fortunately, the voters of Pennsylvania uh, Rejected him pretty substantially. Yeah, and he was and he was running against a Jewish Democrat, and he was ma making anti-Semitic remarks, you know, in the in the process. It was, it, it was just astonishing. Peter Montgomery, the managing director of Right Wing Watch, a fellow senior fellow with the uh, People for the American Way. Uh, Rightwingwatch.org is the website. Right Wing Watch on Twitter. Uh, Peter, let's talk about the mainstreaming of hate in America. You are uh, very knowledgeable about this. Actually, even before we get to that, uh, in the roughly five minutes here we have left, um, I'm also curious, how are the Republicans on Jamie Raskin's committee, as they're hearing all this testimony about white supremacy and violence from white Christian nationalism and, and, and these you know, hate groups, how are the Republicans on his committee in, uh, reacting? You know, it's pretty interesting. Uh, Jamie Raskin was very gracious toward the ranking member, uh, Representative Mace. Uh, but she, my sense of she and the other Republicans, you know, um, said, yes, white supremacy is terrible, but then they, they tried to create all these strongmen and these distractions. Um, they uh, tried to uh, uh, assert that uh, infiltration in law enforcement and military by extremists is not a threat, when we know it is a threat. 
they tried to say that somehow uh, they're, uh, you know, that uh, the Biden administration and the Democrats have labeled any parent who shows up at a school board meeting as a domestic terrorist. And that's never been the case. That's been a, a smear and a, a disinformation tactic by the by the right. Um, and they sort of, you know, talk about this woke army, you know, and Elon Musk talks about a woke mind virus as if somehow there's an equivalence between these mission-driven white nationalist violence-creating people and, you know, someone who's who believes in wokeness, you know. And it was interesting that uh, recently, you know, Ron DeSantis' uh, spokesperson was asked, you know, straight, uh, straight on, well, how do you define wokeness? He said, well, the belief that there's systemic injustice in the country and we ought to do something about it. Okay, sign me up. I'll claim that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I think the Republicans were doing a lot of, uh, you know, saying the right thing in opposing anti-Semitism and white nationalist violence, but then quickly trying to create false equivalencies and distractions. And I think that's uh, pretty much par for the course. That's yeah. That's it's, it's sad and unfortunate that we have a major political party that feels that they have to cater to racists and bigots, basically, uh, in order to get elected. I, I, it's just it's it's breathtaking. Although it's as you pointed out early on, you know this this is the history of the United States. How is this kind of hate and 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 these these how are these worldviews being mainstreamed in the United States and how effectively are we seeing? Um, and particularly now that there's serious pushback against Trump and his popularity is collapsing, are we seeing you know th this kind of right wing hate decreasing in America, starting to flood plateauing, or is it continuing to rise? Yeah, uh, I, I unfortunately don't think we're seeing it decreasing. You know, hate crimes uh, have been on the rise. Anti-Semitism has been on the rise, based on um, statistics from uh, FBI and groups like ADL. And since the January 6th insurrection, since the, its failure to keep Trump back in office, some of the uh, militia-oriented groups or the, um, groups like the Three Percenters uh, and the Proud Boys have really refocused their energies at the local level. And that's where we've really seen this rise in violent harassment against um, uh, people outside LGBTQ events or drag events. Uh, you know, uh, violence and harassment uh, directed at educators and school board officials. So I think um, in some ways it's being uh, localized and certainly being spread on social media. You know, Elon Musk uh, kind of uh, throwing open the doors to Twitter and and denouncing, you know, the, the efforts that had been made toward moderating and restricting that hate, I think is going to prove to be very damaging. You know, one of the one of the uh, actions that people on the experts on the committee uh, called for yesterday was, you know, greater attention to how social media is being used to radicalize people. And um, so we need more thoughtful uh, moderation and more thoughtful um, policies uh, designed to prevent that from happening rather than just, um, you know, putting the pedal to the metal on the uh, promotion of bigotry and extremism in the name of, of free speech. Yeah, well, I, I saw a study that suggested that on Facebook anyway, or maybe it was Twitter, I'd have to find it, um, that uh, right-wing news sources and uh, politicians were six times, 600% more likely to be amplified by the algorithm than were left-wing sources. Um, does that sound about right to you? And if so, maybe what, legislation requiring that the algorithms become transparent? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I, I have seen similar statistics that in spite of all the right wing screaming that somehow these social media platforms silence conservative voices, which is ridiculous. You know, the, the biggest, um, as you mentioned, the biggest circulation happens on the right. And, you know, with, with Twitter, that was even before Elon Musk took over. Right. And now it's, uh, now it's very different. Now the people that are being silenced are his critics. And um, so I think I think that the policymakers hopefully will take a good look at that. I don't I'm not an expert and I don't have a good answer on what the policy should be right. to promote um, 
but we, but we need to do something about it. Yeah. Radicalization. There you go. Peter, Peter Montgomery, Managing Director of Right Wing Watch. Rightwingwatch.org is the website. Right Wing Watch on Twitter. Peter, thank you.